This is going to be another one of those life-changing messages. We talked last week about what grieves the Holy Spirit. And for me, I, I think I was reaching deeper uh, into the Spirit of God than I ever have before by God's grace and talking about what grieves the Holy Spirit. And today, uh, as I was praying throughout the week and what I should minister on, uh, the Holy Spirit said, well, you could talk about the gifts. And I've done that a lot. Many of you are familiar with all the teachings that I do on the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. And if we have time today, maybe I'll get to it. But the Holy Spirit began to give me the reasoning or the purpose for the gifts of the Holy Spirit and something that we can see that's tangible in a different way than just what I'll call the nine power gifts of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to look at two or maybe three different aspects of the Holy Spirit that we've just never looked at before. And I'm going to pray. Dear Father Yahweh Elohim, we invoke your name once again over our time together here today. We give you honor and we give you glory and we give you praise for this message. And Father God, I ask that it would touch our hearts, that we would see and be changed by this word, by your presence, that it would be ever uh, permanent in us. And Father God, I thank you for that now in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I also ask that this word not only goes forth here, but it would go forth uh, out on the airwaves, uh, out on the internet, all around the world, and not be stolen from anyone hearing even a part of it, or any part of it being repeated by anybody that hears it. And Father, I thank you for that now in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen and amen. All right, well, this morning, uh, we're going to start out in 1 Thessalonians. So let's go in our Bibles there today. Again, if you do not have a Bible here today, you are going to need one in order to see what I'm talking about. So raise your hands. The ushers will be happy to get you a Bible. 1 Thessalonians. And we're going to start out in chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. Everyone say conviction. Amen. So the gospel did not come to you in word only. In other words, we're not just reading words and not just having a church service where there's uh, a lot of noise, but it came also in power in the, and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know, what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. One of the greatest uh, tragedies that I believe that the modern church is facing today starts with the modern age that we're facing today. How many people know that grades in the United States, unlike uh, some other uh, countries like, well, like Taiwan, like China, that grades in this country have been falling, that the educational level of children and young adults in this country have been falling, that the uh, scores uh, that are entry level scores to get in the college have been falling and so they've been put on a sort of bell curve in order to allow colleges to let in the status quo of students every single new year uh, that they're bringing in brand new students. So the educational level in this country has been falling dramatically. If you read the histories of many of our leaders of this country, many of them were ambassadors at age 14, at age 16, and at age 18. Many of them knew six languages or 10 languages, and though th probably those were gifted people, but they still existed. And so the educational level of what's happening in our country has been dropping and dropping and dropping. And this great tragedy of the decline of education has affected our ministers so much so that I get frequently from other ministers. Some of them are new ministers. Some of them are people that have been in ministry for 20 to 40 years is a mocking of the study of the history of the church, a mocking or a criticism. And when I say mocking, I mean like a scoffing, like education doesn't mean that much. We just need to move by the Holy Spirit. We don't really need to be concerned with education because education simply is something that's man-made. And that is one of the most ridiculous concepts. And anyone that has gotten into ministry and has begun to study like I have, 
When I first got saved, I was studying a little bit. I, you know, you study the Word of God, but you didn't know there was other things that we should complement our study. And now today in my personal library, I have over 2,500 books and just a library in one room in my home. Plus I have maybe another thousand books in my library here. The personal study of the history of the church and the history of Judaism and other languages outside of our English language, I think is a paramount responsibility of all ministers today, but few ministers take up that standard. In fact, so many ministers, they, there's a call on their life, and yet they don't want to study. They don't want to apply themselves to the things that God wants them to prepare them for, for ministry, for real ministry. So they eventually, they thrust themselves into ministry many times way too early. And they get into ministry and they have these preconceived notions about what ministry is like. And, and one preconceived notion that I see a lot is don't worry about preparing a message. The Holy Spirit will give you one when you get up. Well, many times when they get up to speak and to preach, they don't have a message that they can give from the Holy Spirit because they're completely unprepared. Preparation to preach and preparation for a message is a personal responsibility of every minister. Of every minister. In order to bring the Word of God accurately and soundly and have it be a delightful meal that you can digest when it's being given. A message ought to come across that there needs to be different sections. You know, in the uh, really, really, really old days, if you were wealthy, you had like maybe a seven course meal. So it needs to come out course after course and in order with the, with the timing that the Holy Spirit wants. And if you're unprepared, you can't deliver anything. You're just kind of guessing at where the Holy Spirit wants you to be. So the lack of education in this country and the downsizing of our education, we have different tools uh, that people use. You don't have to add anymore. Just use your cell phone. Uh, you don't have to calculate anything anymore. Uh, you don't have to use a slide rule. Just use your cell phone. Just use your computer. Uh, you don't uh, have to uh, worry about spell check uh, anymore as you're handwriting out something. Spell check is right there on your computer. And what's fascinating is that a lot of people never look at to see what the correct spelling now is. They just, they say, well, thank you, God, for the spell check, and they move on, never really educating themselves in correct spelling of anything. So there's a lack of education. It impacts our pastors. It impacts our ministers. I want to read you some names, and I want you to tell me what you think you know about these names. How about Princeton College? How about Oxford University? How about Yale? How about Harvard? All those colleges and many more colleges that I'm not naming right now, many of them were started in the 1600s were for one single purpose, and that was to educate the American clergy, to give them an education or men wanting to enter the clergy on all different types. So there were Presbyterian colleges that I just named here. There were Anglican churches that I just named here. And when the pastors and the clergy that were already educated in Europe, when they came to the United States and started their churches, they recognized there was nothing to educate the clergy. And they noticed immediately a, a gigantic problem within those young men that were coming up, that there was a call on their life. And is that th the problem was this, that they didn't have the educational level that these other clergy members that came from Europe to the 13 colonies and other, other places here in the United States did not have the backing to understand Scripture, to read the Greek, to read the Hebrew, to read the Latin. They didn't have that understanding. And so when they got up to preach, their ministries suffered compared to the other ministries, the older ministries that had come here from any part in Europe because they went to good colleges. They were expected to study. And so today we have this problem. We have what I consider to be a great tragedy. And people don't understand that and they don't see it. And few men, even in the clergy today, when I say clergy, you know, I'm talking about ministers and pastors, study anything outside of delivery and administration. They think, well, I got to I got to work on my delivery, you know, and then they put a note here. I got plenty of pages here this morning. They put a note here. Uh, speak louder. 
right here. Uh, they put an another note here, stomp your foot once or twice, and another note here, drop your voice so everyone has to really lean in to hear you. And those might be good tools to use to get a message across, and I'm not against doing any of that. I don't do it myself. But what about just plain study of really giving people the background and the history of our, our religion and where it's led up to today? And as a result of that, people get into ministry and they begin to use uh, terminologies and they begin to introduce uh, heresies, heresies into the church. We don't like that term anymore because we don't understand what it means. We're, we're vastly uneducated in this country, not this congregation, but there are people probably watching me on television right now as this is going out on TV. They hear that term heresy and they think, well, you're really old fashioned. No, I'm just educated to know that the term heresy still is a term that has validity today to use. And there are heresies in the church today and people are listening to them and hearing them. And because there's no great education, there's no intellectual assent to what we're supposed to know. That when someone introduces a heresy, someone else will say, well, that sounds good. And then someone will say, someone will follow up and go, well, that must be the Holy Spirit. And then everyone backs down. They don't want to attack it. They don't want to say, well, come on, that was a heresy 200 years ago. It was a heresy 100 years ago. 50 years ago, it's still a heresy today because no one has that education. They don't want to use that terminology either. And so someone says, well, that's just the Holy Spirit. And everyone goes, well, I wonder if that's the Holy Spirit. And they wonder because they don't have the education. They don't have the background. Now, here's what happens. The results are this, that Satan has shaken the church loose from its roots. And so the ministers that there is a true call on have no one to look at, someone to edify as a leader for them to say, this person I want to emulate, I want to copy, I want to follow, I want to be a disciple of this minister because he is educating me and because he's an educated person himself, not overly educated where we're talking above your heads and we're just trying to brag about what we know. That's not the purpose of education. The purpose of the education is to make the Bible come alive, to set it in its, in its setting 2,000 years ago, in its environmental setting, in its setting of languages being used 2,000 years ago, of its setting of the different terminologies that a agrarian type of society would use to get a point across to somebody else. They didn't live in a technological age, they lived in a farming age. And so they're gonna use different terminology than we're using here today, amen. So now, when we think about these things, then we go on, we take this one step further, and I'm, I'm, I'm very, very aggressive about this, and if I get a little aggressive today, it's because I've been grieved over what I've seen happening in ministries. I, people do things that they, they normally couldn't do. Yesterday, I went out with my, two of my sons, and we went golfing, and at the uh, golf course that we went to, they have a dress code. And the dress code is, of course, you can't, you know, come on and bare feet onto the golf course. Uh, but you know what one, the part of the dress code is? You can't wear T-shirts. You have to wear collared shirts. And another golf course in the area has the same type of dress code if you're going to be out on the course. And there's certain clothing that you can only wear on a golf course. And the majority of the people there willingly enthusiastically follow the dress code. We were at this golf course yesterday and while I'm at the golf course and a bunch of people began showing up and I heard that there was a big, big wedding going on there being held there and it was gonna be held outside and, and, they, and they were having you know, some of the festivities inside the buildings. And I saw all the young men that were from the area. In fact, some of them came up to one of my sons and recognized him and said, yeah, we heard about you. You're in the military, in the Marine Corps, and good to see you back home for a little bit. And, you know, so they were talking, and everyone was dressed to the nines. 
Um, the majority of the men had on uh, a white shirt and a, and a black suit and, and a tie. Uh, some of the young men, a lot of young men, had vests on, and they're walking around. And it wasn't all that hot yesterday, but they were standing around in the sun in midday, so that was hot. And they're walking around with their hands in their pockets, and they're just having a good time. And it is a wedding. And they dressed up for the wedding. And I was grieved in my heart that the example that they see to be on the golf course and dressed well, and the example that they see to go to a wedding and a ceremony and then the festivities afterwards, even at a golf, at non-church, it wasn't at a church, it's at a golf course, that they dressed as if they were in the presence of God. And yet many ministers today show up in t-shirts throw towels around their neck that look like they came from a third world hotel room and begin to rub themselves and preach like that's the power of God because they have no idea of the respect and honor we should give our God. And I was grieved. I got my clubs with me and I'm grieved. I couldn't believe it. That I don't have to tell a bunch of young men to dress up for a wedding and a reception. And I don't have to tell people on the golf course, wear a shirt with a collar on it. But you got to tell church preachers, you need to dress better for church. What is wrong? Let's see, this is what the uneducated society, and many of these men have even been to college, but they're uneducated as to the history of why up until about 200 years ago, every minister wore a frock of some kind and honored God in the way that he looked. Amen. Every minister, not just Catholics, not just Presbyterians, not just Methodists, but every single denomination, denominational minister. And society has broken down. We have broken down the walls. So we're just trying to reach more people. I don't know anyone that my tie has offended except for another preacher that refuses to wear a tie. I've never offended a young man at a wedding with a tie who doesn't know Jesus when I walk up to him in a tie and begin to tell him a little bit about Jesus. I've never had him turn around and go like, man, I don't like you preaching at me with that tie. I've never heard it. I've never seen it. And I think the grieving in me wasn't Dave Gonzalez. The grieving was the Holy Spirit in me. The Holy Spirit is grieved when, when people have enough sense Therefore, I came to this conclusion, and I told my wife this last night, that these same men that get up there and rub their heads with towels and sweat through their t-shirts while they're preaching wouldn't be allowed on the golf course I was on and wouldn't be allowed to go to that wedding reception. But we as church people accept this kind of behavior, silly behavior, and it grieves the Holy Spirit. And you may think I'm old fashioned. I'm not old fashioned. I'm just connected to my roots. I'm connected to where I came from and where the ministry of Jesus Christ has been for the last 2,000 years. I know what the history is and I know when it's changed. Amen. We took prayer out of school in the 60s, Roe versus Wade in 1972. We got all kinds of reasons why we can't say God in the Pledge of Allegiance anymore. We've taken away the education for our up and coming ministers. And that grieves the Holy Spirit. They don't have the roots and their parents don't have the roots. This is why parents don't discipline their children anymore. They want to be their friend. Well, I just want to give them a time out. I'll give them a time out. I'll even teach you how to give them a time out. Amen. Amen. One time and you're out. Yep. Amen. Amen. <laughs> My uh, sons were telling me the other day, uh, how uh, I disciplined them after they uh, did something really bonzo in, our, in one of our barns. They hooked up a, a line of string, a line of wire or string from one end of the barn building in the second floor to the other, connected one of the model rockets with the actual propellant and fuel, right? Lit it and watched it just go across the barn as it's throwing sparks and flames everywhere, right? I was really proud of them for doing it, but I couldn't show them. I had to take them out, man. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right. So the early church had eyewitnesses to the disciples of Jesus. Do you know that? 
The early church had eyewitnesses, and then the eyewitnesses of the eyewitnesses had disciples themselves. These became our founding church fathers 2,000 years ago. How many preachers even know what their names are? I don't know any. I know a few preachers that can throw out a few names, but then if I ask them one, a secondary question, they don't even know where it comes from. Because they don't study. They don't know the roots of our faith. And if you don't know the roots of our faith, the Holy Spirit can't work in us the way the Holy Spirit wants to work in us. Because we don't, we have a shallow understanding of what the Holy Spirit, then the baptism of the Holy Spirit, wants to do in our life. And here's the thing, most people don't know this, that all these early church fathers wrote massive commentaries that are still available today being translated from either the original Latin or the original Greek, sometimes even in Aramaic and a few times in Hebrew, and translated into our modern English and we can read it just like they intended it to be read in English today. We can read it and we can get an understanding of what they're talking about and what they were facing and the different problems that was facing the early churches all over the Mediterranean and the European areas, even as far north as Great Britain. All these things were being written so that we would have an understanding. God preserved them intact so that we could read them today. But if I threw out some names, and I won't, don't want to do it here this morning, if I threw out some names, a lot of ministers would not know, most ministers wouldn't know what I'm talking about. So what does this produce in their congregations? An illiterate congregation looking for sweat and tears, but not really looking to grow in God. Christianity is the thinking man's religion. Amen. Christianity is the thinking man's religion. And I'm just giving you natural conclusions that I saw over the last 24 hours, and you're going, yes, amen, that makes a lot of sense, but how many people aren't connecting the dots? And they're right there in front of them, but they can't see them. Yeah. Amen. Turn with me over to uh, John chapter 1. John chapter 1. In verse 32, John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained on him. I did not recognize him. But he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, all right, so I want to break down verse 33. So John the Baptist has a ministry. The Father in heaven spoke to him and said specifically, I'm sending you to baptize in water. Later on, John gets spoken to again, and he said to me, and he gives it here to us verbatim, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. So he said, when you see the Holy Spirit, there was a, a visible person of the Holy Spirit, not a dove, by the way, a visible person of the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus as he came up out of the water. But John was pre-prepared to see this. He was told by God, first go out and baptize. Then later on he's told, hey, by the way, my son, my only beloved son, he's going to be coming and you're going to have to water baptize him. And this is how you will identify who he is. When he goes down into the water and then comes back up, you'll see the Holy Spirit come on him. That's the one. That's how you'll know. And then God tells him, God the Father tells him a second thing. And he says, this is the one who's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So John the Baptist has a prophecy given to him by heaven alone, not by men, not by readings, but by heaven alone of how he's going to identify his cousin. Apparently hadn't seen him in a while. Wasn't really sure who he was looking at. So he wasn't going to be identify him by someone that he was related to. He's only going to be able to identify him by what has occurred. And heaven alone prepared John the Baptist for that. That's powerful. Then, then John does something that is very, very biblical. In verse 34, he says this, I myself have seen and have testified. So John is giving an oath. 
And by the way, if you know Jews and if you know anything about Judaism, one of the big deals in Judaism today, as well as back in Jesus' day, as well as from the Old Testament, is if you gave your word, you did not break your word. If you gave an oath, if you put your hand on the Bible, you're in court, and if they say, so help me God, you're saying, so help me God, every word and the, and the intent of the word is going to be true. I will not give you a word twisted so that I can say I gave you the word, but I had a different intent for you to hear it. Amen. Are you with me? So he, he made an oath and he's making an oath right here. Now remember, this is the same man who's telling the Sadducees, the scribes, the tax collectors, and even some of the, the uh, Romans that are coming to be water baptized, and he baptized Romans too, by the way. He told them, what should we do? We read that last week. He said, repent. Don't take more than you're supposed to take. Don't uh, move into houses. Don't take widow's property. He told them, what should we do in our repentance? And he gave them three instructions to three different groups of people. So this is the man who's hardcore about telling people what they need to do. And he's saying to us as readers today, I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. So he's given an oath. He's saying, so help me God if I'm lying. What's that modern term? Right? So... He's not lying. And he's not going to have to pay the penalty. Every minister has a personal responsibility and every Christian has a personal responsibility to discern the truth about what they're hearing that's being called Christianity. You all have a personal responsibility. If you're watching something on TV and you're beginning to get excited because it sounds really good, check yourself. Ask the Holy Spirit, is this for real? I'll tell you again, like I've told you hundreds of times from this pulpit, don't believe me. Go back and study it out for yourself. Take copious notes and go back home and check it out for yourself. Is what I have told you true? Check it out for yourself. You can, by the way, that kind of study will help you get better in the Word of God and will make you less susceptible. I know people that claim that they're studying that don't. And as a result of it, when someone comes in and gives, gives them some harebrained denominational teaching, they go, oh, that sounds pretty good. And they're like being hooked and they're pulled out of the place where God wants them to be. All right. So every Christian has a personal responsibility to discern the truth. All right. What we see happening here is that John is told, number one, you're going to be identifying by the Holy Spirit. And number two, Jesus is going to be the one baptizing in the Holy Spirit. So can you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit without Jesus? The answer is no. Let's go on to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, or back up to Luke chapter 3. Verse 21. Now when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came out of heaven, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. Now jump over to chapter 4, verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. All right? Just so, just so that you understand, these chapter headings and verses were not here when these were originally written, by the way, uh, they were written originally in Hebrew. I just need to say that again. Uh, all the, all, there's too many uh, Hebraic terminologies in here that are transliterated into the Latin and then into the Greek. The four Gospels were written in Hebrew by Hebrews who understood Hebrew, who could write Hebrew. Not Aramaic, not Greek. And they weren't Greeks. They weren't uh, Romans, so they didn't write in Latin. They wrote in, wrote in Hebrew to Hebrew-speaking people. And these chapter headings and the verse numbers were not there. They were put in there, roughly started to get put in there uh, right around the 1200s in some Bibles, and then it became adopted over a period of 300, 400 years to be something where there was a universal way for us to reference the Scripture. 
Remember when Jesus went in to preach in a synagogue and they handed him the book of the prophet Isaiah? It wasn't really a book, it was a scroll. So you unroll it from both sides and it was very nicely done because the Jews just made their, their scrolls look very, very handsome. They, it wasn't just like you were unrolling uh, a garbage bag or something. It was nice. And it says, he found in the book where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He found in the scroll where it was written. And he knew how to look in the scroll. And he didn't have chapter headings and verses like we have today. Isn't that good? Yeah. So we have this. So when we're reading from chapter 3 to chapter 4, we think we're starting a new, set, a new period of thought when all these thoughts are all running together from what I just read to chapter 4, verse 1. So I'm going to read it again. Verse 21, and when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized while he was praying. Heaven was open and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came out of heaven. You are my beloved son and you I am well pleased. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. Now, I, I dropped out those other verses just to connect the flow of the thought. And when you see this here, you think, well, the, the flow really isn't there. I don't know why you're moving on to another chapter. The flow is there. You just have to take those chapter headings out of there for a moment just to understand that. What do we see happening here? We see three things happening here. All right. First of all, the baptism of the Holy Spirit transformed Jesus. And this is for you all here today. The baptism of the Holy Spirit transformed Jesus. This event of Jesus being baptized in the Holy Spirit is in all, all four Gospels. It's so important that all the four Gospel writers put it in there. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's all in there. Every single one. Every single time. And all of them say the Holy Spirit fell on him or came upon him like a dove. So we see that happening. And then the next thing occurs in all four Gospels. Chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. Now it's being worded different ways in the other three Gospels. But essentially, he goes out. And the first thing that we see is he becomes a different man than he was before. We read in the Old Testament someone else that became a, a man that was different from who he was before, and that was King Saul. When he came into the presence of the, of the prophets, the, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit came on him temporarily. And he fell out, and it was said of him, is Saul now amongst the prophets? Because he acted like a different man, at least for a period of time. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit transformed Jesus in three ways. Number one, Jesus, it says in, in Matthew 4, Jesus was led up by the Spirit. In Mark chapter 1, it says Jesus, the Spirit impelled him to go. The Bible also tells us that he was to go and be tempted of the devil. In all four Gospels, we see the Spirit is driving him. That's the first thing. The second thing that happens when he's in the wilderness is he's being tempted by the devil. Now, Jesus, we know, was a perfect lamb, and he went to the cross as a perfect lamb for our, imperfect, our imperfections. So the perfect lamb goes to the cross, which means he wasn't in sin before. So I'm not suggesting that the ability to deal with the devil was something that he really, 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 really needed. But the devil did tempt him. The Bible says the devil tempted him. If Jesus could not have been tempted, the Bible is lying to you and I. So if Jesus was beyond temptation, the Bible would be an error to say he was tempted when he really couldn't be tempted. If you, can't, yeah, if you came to me with a pack of cigarettes, you'd go, hey, you want to smoke? I'd go, no, because I can't be tempted with cigarettes. Jesus couldn't be tempted with the things the devil was throwing at him if he was so perfect and so unhuman like but he was human so the devil tempted him and if he couldn't have fallen we wouldn't see that terminology today all right so the second thing get this now the second thing that the baptism of the holy spirit did for jesus is it gave him the ability to resist temptation and the wiles of the devil it gave him an authority and a power he never had 
before. Jesus gave us a pattern of being first water baptized and then secondarily, because it happened 50 days later, being baptized in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, he gave us two baptisms. One was of water, and that water dries off, and it is symbolic of what, ch what changed inside of us. You can go to heaven without water baptism. You can go to heaven without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're probably going to have a powerless life. I know plenty of men that grew up in strict homes. They don't drink. They don't smoke. They don't chew. They don't know anyone who do. They don't even have a tattoo. And they, they, that strict regime that they grew up with has has been with them as they enter in to public ministry. But because they don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when temptations come their way and the devil sees them getting bigger, they fall into sexual sin. They start sleeping around with the women in the church or they become a pedophile. Or if they have homosexual tendencies, they're starting to sleep with other men in the church. And all of a sudden becomes public information because they did not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit as to resist that next level, next devil, time of their life. As God is moving them up the chain of command, they don't have the power to resist the devil because they've never had to resist in that particular area. And so the second power that came on Jesus, besides the actual power, the nine giftings of the Holy Spirit, which we see later on is he was given the power to resist temptation. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. And I'm going I'm to prove it to you. The easiest way to, for me to prove it to you is once you got saved, you started looking at things differently. You read the Word of God. But did you always have power to resist temptations, particularly old temptations that just seemed to hang around? And the answer is, I can tell you, because I know this personally, from education and from speaking personally to ministers outside of the spirit-filled camps, is they generally do not have the capability to resist certain types of hang-ups. Sometimes there are only three, but only one of the three will take a minister down. And I don't know which three it might be for other ministers, but generally it only amounts to three. And they go, well, it's only three. Well, it's the three, those, one of those three can take you down if you're not careful. But what happens when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God convicts us, but the Holy Spirit gives us a desire to change things. And so when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, parts of your personality, you're not going to like. You're going to see aspects of who you are and you're going to hate yourself for it. And that's not wrong, that's right. The Jews have a philosophy from the Ten Commandments, from Exodus chapter 20, about statues. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make an image of a god. You shall not worship other gods. All right, first three commandments. And so the Jews, out of the Ten Commandments, d developed a philosophy that you don't make statues. But in, it, but in Jerusalem today, there's a statue of King David. And I asked... A Jewish rabbi that was in my tour, this one tour I was on, I, I said, you're a rabbi. He had never been in Jerusalem before, so that was his first time. And I asked him, why is a, a statue of King David right here? <laughs> it's called David Square. Why is he here? And he didn't really know. And so one of the other, because it's against Judaism to have a statue of a person. And then another person came up that was listening to my questioning, and he came up and he said, because this statue is imperfect. You see his nose has been chipped. The Jews are allowed to have statues as long as the statues are imperfect. Not in every, we'll call denomination of Jewelry today, but it's generally become an accepted fact. Because human beings are not perfect. 
And we shouldn't see ourselves as perfect. But the problem also with the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the claim that we're walking in the baptism of the Holy Spirit is this, that we are so powerful. <sighs> we are so powerful. We can move mountains. And then we begin to think higher of ourselves than we should. And when we begin to think higher than ourselves than we should, we become like Satan in the five I wills. I will mount up to heaven. I will sit on his throne. I will overthrow the most high God. And what happened to Satan because of his pride? His pride came up because of his beauty. But Satan was not perfect. Satan's never been perfect. He's a created being just like you and I are. So well, he's an angel of God. Yeah. But he still had imperfections. Only God is perfect. Even Jesus made the claim, why do you call me good? There is only one who is good. Jesus said that. I didn't say that. You figure it out. So the Holy Spirit gives us the power to resist sin. And then we begin to get even more convicted, more so than just ordinary salvation on levels that we didn't get convicted on before, and then I can tell you that you can begin to hate yourself if you're not careful. And this is why you have to allow the grace of God to come in. Amen. You have got to have room now for another teaching on another day, the grace of God. You've got to understand that's what the grace is for. If salvation is by works, then you've earned it, then there's no room for grace. Grace comes when you can't earn what you need. So we know that we're imperfect. <sighs> what you never thought about, what you never cared about, what you never considered before, you start now considering in yourself. Well, I never thought about that before, but this is starting to bother me. And then after a while, you begin to recognize that when you get grieved over something, it's not you grieving, it's the Holy Spirit in you grieving over a particular thing. You know all liars are going to be thrown into hell? All liars. It didn't say some liars, it said all liars. Which means this. Which means that when you hear, you're watching something on TV, maybe it's on the news, maybe it's something else, and you know that you're hearing a lie, you'll be grieved in your spirit. But I can tell you something else. You can be grieved in your spirit that you're hearing a lie, and you don't know, naturally speaking, that it's a lie. The Holy Spirit comes on you. You'll begin studying things, seeing things in yourself differently. You'll be grieving over things in yourself and other people. And you'll grieve over things. Because the Holy Spirit grieves. We learned about his personality last week. One of the personality traits of the Holy Spirit is he grieves. He warns. He talks. He can be lied to. These are the, these are the attributes of the Holy Spirit. And so when the Holy Spirit's being lied to, this is why when Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5 came in and laid this gift down at the disciples' feet. First it was the husband. He laid it there and the apostle Peter said, is this the amount that you sold the property for? He goes, yes. He goes, why did you test, and lie, test the Holy Spirit and lie to him? He said, the men that are in the door are going to carry you out. Bang, he falls dead. His wife comes in several hours later and Sapphira, and she, he goes to her, is this what you and your husband sold a piece of property for? She goes, yes, amen. And they brought in a big gift to the church. He killed off one of the tithers. <laughs> Think about that. That's gutsy. And he said, the men that carried your husband out are going to carry you out. And immediately she fell dead because they lied to the Holy Spirit. Which means that some people can get the baptism of the Holy Spirit and walk away from it. Some people never really receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit because if they were lying, they would have been grieved before they said that because the Holy Spirit would have warned them, don't lie to the disciple. Tell them the truth and you'll live. So where did their money go to after they died that they held back? Went to somebody, but they didn't have it. Not any longer. And so they lied for no reason. So again, the second Baptism produces three results. The power gifts of the Holy Spirit, as, we're, as we'll read about in another week. The leading of the Holy Spirit to go do what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. And a resistance to sin that you never had before. 
that you never had before. I'm going to take you over to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 7. The Apostle Paul is talking. Remember, Paul was Saul. Remember, the Apostle Paul had killed Christians, had put them, incarcerated them, had taken away their property. Now he's saved, and he writes two thirds of what we know today as the modern New Testament. Verse 7, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, right? So the Apostle Paul is getting a lot of revelations. He describes one just above that. You can go back and read it, but that's not the only one. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. This is an imperfect statue. We're seeing an imperfect Paul talk about his imperfections openly. He doesn't say what it is. Now, I can tell you a lot of mainline denominations claim it was a physical attribute, and they do not know the truth. It was not a physical attribute. It was a comprehension issue, or it was an iniquity. And I firmly believe that it was an iniquity. You know what an iniquity is? It's not, iniquity is not sin. It's the propensity to sin when the opportunity arises. And with the Apostle Paul, I think his propensity to pride was his biggest crime. He was full of pride when he was young. He was an intellectual giant. Very short man, skinny man, but an intellectual giant amongst his peers. And he knew he had the Holy Ghost. He knew he had power happening. And so his pride, he would go and heal people and you could see pride would want to, and maybe it wasn't pride, maybe it was another type of a sin, but pride's a big sin. And so this devil is sent to him. It's not God sending this devil. It says, look at this. A messenger of Satan, by the term malek in Hebrew, is the term we use for angel in Hebrew, but it's defined as messenger. So he's speaking in Hebrew still, at least in his own mind, he's using a translation with the Corinthians, and he's saying that a messenger, a angel of Satan, came to torment me to keep me from exalting myself. Now God allowed it, but God didn't send it. And it produced an imperfection in Paul where Paul had to keep checking himself. And I think that those of you who don't check yourself on a daily basis are in more trouble than those of you that do. Amen. If you're not checking yourself daily about your condition, now you're going to have good days, maybe even good periods of days. But if you're not listening to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the one that points out the chip nose on your statue. The Holy Spirit is the one that points that out. And this is why you can begin to grieve over your personality because you're just not perfect enough for heaven yet. By the way, when you go to heaven, do you know you're still going to lack the perfection of God? You're going to be in a glorified body, but you're still going to be substantially lower than the God of heaven and earth. Who made you? Who gave you the glorified body? When we say imperfect, I don't mean that you're going to be in sin. You're just not going to be perfect. So get, ri get, get used to your imperfections. You won't have the types of ones you have now. Thank goodness. Right? Those ugly toes of yours, you'll be rid of. Amen. You'll get your hair back for you. You get my point. Amen. So the Holy Spirit gives power, gives direction and leading, and the Holy Spirit gives a type of grieving conviction over ourselves. Let me keep reading. Concerning, verse 8, concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. Now, he's, he's, he implored Jesus about this, okay? That's the impression I get here and not the Father. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Power is perfected in weakness. I am grieved in my spirit when I see people on TV 
telling their congregations and their television audiences, you can go three weeks without sinning. That is lame. It's not Bible. It is so full of pride, it's twisted. And it's in the spirit-filled camps. And it's addictive. Because now, if you want to compete with Joe Sixpack that's preaching down the street, that's on all these Christian television networks, you got to keep up with him by saying, you don't sin for two or three weeks. Because an uneducated congregational viewing audience doesn't know that that's wrong. They don't have the education to know that that's wrong. You can't say that. That is bombast. You cannot say you are without sin. You can't go through a day without sin, which means you can't go through a day without Jesus. You can't go through a day without the Holy Spirit. But it is the Holy Spirit that points out the infirmities within you so that you have a proper edification of yourself I'll tell you everything that I know about you right now if I go to you and by the, in the natural and I say bang 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 I go all the way around the church here this morning and I say this is what's wrong with you you're going to go because I really know what's wrong with me and it may not be anything big but you know it grieves the Holy Spirit you know it. It might be anger, it might be judgmentalism, it might be a critical spirit, you might be a professional scoffer. You just scoff at any, everything. You're, just, you, you're famous for not believing anything good. Maybe you just got a bad attitude all the time. You're mean to your dog and your wife. It could be anything. You know it. And if I went and said, you know what, Dave, you really just got to work on your ties. You keep wearing the same tie. You're not going to go, whew, my, I'll make it out of church today if he really knew what was wrong with me. And it's not because it's some gross immorality or something that would, could send you to jail or to prison or get you in trouble with society, but you know the Holy Spirit doesn't like it. You know it. And that imperfection, that tainted statue of who you are, is being told this in verse 9. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for power is perfected in weakness. In other words, when your pride is dropped, Paul, then you can do more for me than when you're full of bombast and you're bragging about yourself everywhere you go. And you're telling everyone how great you are and what your future is and how great you're going to be. I'm going I'm I'm to allow Satan. I didn't send him. He said, I'm going to, he asked three times for it to be removed. Some of you have temptations that you just go, when is this going to go away? Amen. But there might be the hint of pride somewhere in your personality, and the only way to check it is to let the Holy Spirit to let you know you're not all that. Not yet. Yeah. You're, not, you're not there yet. And, yeah, and, and I'm going to tell you, for the older people, Remember what happened with the woman that was caught in the act of adultery? Right? They drag him out and said, we caught her in the act of adultery. What, is the, what does Moses say to do? And Jesus is scribbling on the ground, scribbling on the ground. Right? Some people think they all know what he was scribbling on the ground. He was just buying time. And what he said, he said, he was without sin, cast the first stone. Ooh. And who dropped the stones first? It was the old guys. Yeah. It was everyone with gray hair first, then the guys running underneath them, and the dropping came all the way down, and the young guys with a bunch of steam that were 17, ready to stone somebody, were the last ones to walk away. Sometimes the Holy Spirit has to check us no matter what our age is at. Because we can be walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. We can have a bright future. We can know for a fact that God has called us to great things. And yet pride can be there. And we have to be careful of that. Because the pride can, take, can destroy everything that God has been doing in you. And by the way, this is not a message aimed at men. There's a lot of women that have been called the good things Ladies, you've got to be careful of that pride. It's as big in, in women as it is in men. Men just display it differently. Amen. Amen. All 
I'm going to close it here in Luke chapter 11, Luke 11, verse 9. So I say to you, ask and it will be given you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. All right, so the Jesus is talking, and he's talking about the principles of just simply walking in the power of God. Verse 10, for everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish, he will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he's asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And I'd like to say that this is not just giving of the Holy Spirit and it's a one-time act, but having the Holy Spirit move on you in ways. I pray many, many, many times before I begin to write a message, I'll walk around in my house and I'll worship God and I'll praise and I say, Holy Spirit, give me a message that your people need to hear. Tell me what you want to write. And I can write half a message and not know where it's, how it's going to finish because I don't have the end. I'm just writing because God has told me to write. I'm just writing. And then when it's all finished, I go, wow, isn't that great? But it was the Holy Spirit. And he said, I can pray that the Holy Spirit gives me the, these types of results. So it's not just a one-time act. It's a continual feeding of the Holy Spirit in the different needs that you have. And I don't just use the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit for help in writing messages. I use the Holy Spirit and ask Him for help in everything that I do. And everything that I'm involved in. Amen. Amen. Remember the song Amazing Grace? Amen. A man named John Newton wrote that song. In fact, he ended the, the hymn. It's called the hymn. He ended up writing 268 hymns, 267 hymns. In his early years, his first seven years of his life, his mother, a Christian, developed him, but she died of tuberculosis. He went on to become a mariner with his father, and he learned all kinds of bad stuff. Now, his father was well-disciplined in marining. He was a captain. He was famous. He was rich. But he wasn't saved. And eventually, John Newton fell into the slave trade. And so he, would, he made deals, and, and there's a lot of this history about him, but the, the specific thing is he would curse so bad on these slave ships that he would make even the other sailors block their ears. They all said he cursed worse than anyone that they've ever heard, and he grew up under a Christian mother. And that Christian mother prophesied two things, that he was going to marry this specific cousin of his, distant cousin, and number two, he was going to become a preacher. And he remembered that. And he wasn't running away from God. He was just living this lifestyle. And so he got into the slave trade. And he was the worst person on board on any ship, whether it was a slave ship or any other ship. And he became a captain of his own ship in slave, in, involved in slave trading. And then one day when one of the ships he was on was about ready to go down, in his opinion, he called on the Lord. He was like 24. And then all of a sudden, all of his Bible teaching came back. Later on, he wrote Amazing Grace that saved a wretch like me. The direction of the Holy Spirit will lead you in a way that will take you so completely out of where you are at right now and lead you in such a different direction. He ended up becoming, leaving the slave trade, becoming a preacher, writing 260 whatever hymns, becoming exceedingly well known, where we, if I, if I read a hundred of the hymns, many of you, if you grew up in a denominational church, would know half of them. Took him completely away, and he ended up marrying that woman. That his mother prophesied over. Lived to be 82 years old, carried his ministry right up to the day that he died. Full of the Spirit of God. When the Holy Spirit, like Jesus, he was led about in the wilderness, we can be led about, and when those things are spoken of us, we can be unwilling to receive them. It doesn't matter if we walk in the Holy Spirit, he'll take us gently by the hand. Amen. You know, I, I don't want to be a mother, I want to work. 
I don't want to work at this. I don't want to work at this one thing. I want to do something else. And yet God can be leading us and we're not going to be aware of it. Give the Lord a hand clap here today. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Father. Father, we give you glory and we give you honor and we give you praise. And Father, we thank you for your word here today. We thank you, Father God, that you're changing us. We thank you for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for that chipped part of our statue, for humbling us in a way so that we don't get out of your will. We give you glory in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen.